My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There's no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and who loves and, and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from seeking, speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all their bones, not one of them is broken. Evil, evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Thank you, Father, for this psalm that reminds us over and over again repeatedly of your ability, ability to deliver those who entrust themselves to you. We thank thee, Father, that thou art a God who, are, who is mindful of us, that you watch our way, that you guard and guide and protect, and that you deliver us out of all of our troubles. We thank you, Father, also for the honesty, though, of the psalmist as well, when he talks about the fact that the afflictions of the righteous are many. And so we see from that, Father, that it's not always the case that when you're a Christian, all your problems dry up and go away. And yet we can be confident that whatever adversity you send to us by your providence in this sad world, you will turn to our good. We thank you, Father, also for, for the joy that we can have in knowing and serving you. Thank you, Father, this isn't a transitory joy that can be swept away by the circumstances or events of life, but this is a deeply grounded joy, grounded in the reality of that thou art the sovereign God of the whole universe, and that thou hast redeemed us for the sake of Christ and made us your ambassadors, your people, your emissaries, to do your bidding. And for that, Father, we have reason to be joyful no matter what afflictions might come into our life. For that reason, we have reason to rejoice always because we are your people. We are the apple of your eye. Thank you, Father, for your tenderness towards us at all times. We pray that you would encourage us now through this gathering in the evening service. We pray, Father, that thy name would be upheld and honored and glorified and that we might leave here a little more anchored in our undoubted Catholic Christian faith. Thank you, Father, for the music that we've already sung. Thank you for the ability to worship you in song. Grant us grace to be mindful of the songs that we sing throughout the week, that we might be careful not to place anything upon our lips that is, that is displeasing to you. Grant us grace, Father, to go on to the very end. Grant us a willingness to be different if that's what you've called us to. Grant us a willingness not to go along with our peers just because they're our peers and we want to fit in. Grant it to be the grace that we set the direction that they want to follow. Grant us grace and to be leaders. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This chapter is titled The Goal of Systematics. I was encouraged, even though last, reading, last week's reading was uh, perhaps a little abstract, I was encouraged because uh, Amy this week was able to draw something from what we talked about, read about last Wednesday, and make a concrete application. Uh, I think it was in class Wednesday when that happened. So that was encouraging. So we continue to move through. This is The Goal of Systematics. Remember we said systematic theology is necessary so that we think without contradictions. Once you begin to think systematically in a biblical Christian worldview, uh, you have the joy of going insane. And the only reason that's so is because you begin to see 
how the world around you is full of contradiction, inconsistencies. And then you have to pray for patience. God would give you wisdom. Choose which hills to die on, so forth. The goal of systematics. A society under the influence of Neoplatonism, remember Neoplatonism divides the world into the upper realm and the lower realm, the realm of ideas and the concrete world. A society under the influence of Neoplatonism will seek to be spiritual or, re or in revolt to be materialistic. Both goals are illusory because spirit and matter can never be isolated. The antithesis is between spirit and matter. And the whole man is involved in every activity. Okay, so let's give an example of, of what he's talking about here in ancient church history. In ancient church history, there was this, this same Platonism that was involved. The matter was bad, the spirit was good, right? So because of that, what often would happen is you'd get those who were trying to punish the body because they saw the body as being wicked. And so uh, extreme examples is you'd have saints that go out and roll around in brambles and thorns so as to try to uh, remove from themselves lust and temptation by inflicting pain on themselves. Or they'd go long seasons without food. Or uh, they would discipline themselves like Simon Stylides by crawling up on some kind of cliff and, and just sitting on this high, uh, high cliff for days and days on end because the body was evil. But out of the same reasoning, there would be those who would embrace the body and say, well, since the body doesn't mean anything, I can do with it whatever I want. And so they would be involved in all kinds of... Uh, uh, partying and sexual carousing um, for the same reasoning. And I'm an example where the same reasoning leads to opposite kinds of action. So, all of that is the idea of Neoplatonism. In Marxism, we have the revolt from idealism, the reign of platonic ideas to materialistic determination. So what Marxism says, it gets rid of Neoplatonism, it gets rid of the realm of ideas, it says the only role that is real is what world? The material, right? There is no spiritual. There is no mind. You know, the famous quote I like to say, the mind produces thought like the liver, liver produces bile. Right? There is no soul. Right? Idealism. Or that's materialism. Of course, the extent to which Marx abandoned Neoplatonism is questionable. He's clearly an intellectual heir of Plato. In spite of this, Marx did succeed because he broke clearly with one aspect of the older tradition, the reign of criticism. Again, it's true that a new kind of criticism, Marxism form, replaced the older humanistic standard of criticism, but all the same, Marx was openly hostile to the entire philosophical tradition of humanism when he declared his 11th of the thesis of Feuerbach, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So he didn't want to understand the world. He just wanted to change it. According to Marx, idealism rests on the primacy and the determining power of mind or ideas, whereas in reality, he insisted, the prior determinative factor in history is not mind, but matter. Ultimacy for the idealist is in ideas. Ultimacy for the materialist is in matters because ideas don't exist. They're unreal. Everything is material. And an idea is not material, therefore an idea is not real. Right? Whenever the brain produces thoughts, it's a biochemical reaction. There's, there's nothing there besides biochemical reactions going on in the brain. That's Marxism. That's much of what we see today. As a result, Marx interpreted history in terms of the processes of production. Civil society in its various stages and institutions is the outcome of material forces. This is also true of all theoretical products and all forms of consciousness, religion, philosophy, ethics, and so on. To hold otherwise, Marx insisted, is idealistic humbug. So philosophy, of course, he discounted unless it was materialism. So the idea, again, of ideas of a higher realm, he didn't have anything to do with. For Marx, not criticism, but revolution is the driving force of history. Also religion, a philosophy, and other types of theory. For the open or implicit idealist, ideas are ultimate, and therefore whether the idealist is an empiricist or a rationalist, criticism is basic. Critical analysis is a necessary application of the principle of ultimacy. Man's autonomous mind and the problems of man, time, and history. With the decline of Christian faith, philosophy became powerful in history, beginning with the scholastics renewed by Descartes and culminating in Hegel, for whom the rational is the real. The philosophes, those, those of the French Revolution, could with reason speak of the omnipotence of criticism because of the basic faith of the day ascribed to its critical analysis. So when it talks about 
the omnipotence of criticism, it was criticism that was based on man as being autonomous. Right? So it was criticism based on man being God, criticizing everything around him. Marx dethroned the primacy of ideas. That's the unreal world, according to Marx. He dethroned the primacy of ideas and the older form of humanism. Philosophy, according to its preeminence to sociology and to political economic theories. These were philosophies and ideas, to be sure, but ones which asserted the priority, priority and ultimacy of the material. Now again, this is how you deal with an atheist. Right? When you begin to argue with an atheist, he'll begin ultimately to use logic right, to prove his atheism. Mm -hmm. But the problem with logic is it's not what? It's not material. Logic is not material. Can you smell logic? Can you taste it? Can you point it to me and say, and say that's logic? It's not material. It's immaterial. And the problem with the atheist is he doesn't what? He doesn't believe, he doesn't believe in the immaterial. And so when the atheist begins to use logic to overturn Christianity, he has at that point done what? Contradict himself. He's contradicted himself and he's overturned himself. All right? So you can't let an atheist get away with using logic because it defies his own materialistic worldview. Do you understand what I'm getting at there? So this is a classic example of what I've taught you repeatedly that I got from Dr. Van Til. When he starts using logic, he climbs up in God's lap in order to slap him in the face because he's assuming God in order to deny God or to refute him. The joy of Marx and Engels over the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, Species is understandable. Darwin accepted, meant the acceptance of a mindless universe and hence the inevitability of materialistic determination. So when Darwin came out with the Origin of Species, they went, they went goo goo. Because what Darwin gave is a, is, was an origin of beginnings that was, did not include what? God. Did not conclude, include the non-material. Because God is spirit, right? Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when Darwin came out, it was the perfect timing for their atheistic worldview because it fit perfectly with their full materialism. Everybody with me? So now you understand a little bit, at least what we looked at last week. If there, is, there are those who believe that all that is is the material. There are those who believe that all there is is the spiritual. And there are those then who try to embrace both by dividing them one from another. Those would be the Neoplatonists. Right? So that this world is material, and then you have the realm of ideas, and the, never, the two never coincide. So where are we? We would be neither one of those three, because we would believe that God has created the universe, therefore material is, matter is good, right? Matter is good, because God made it. So as we read earlier, the antithesis isn't between the spiritual and material. The antithesis is between God's people and the people of the devil. So while there are kind of two opposites saying material only exists, spiritual only exists, we could be kind of the opposite of Neoplatonism because they put those at odds while we make right, while we integrate, them. while we integrate them, right? And and that work of integrating them is always ongoing work, and it's some, it's difficult to do, but we we never divorce them from one another. So in other words, you and I are made of what? Matter. And Right, because God did what? He breathed into us the breath of life. What is it that he breathed into? The pound of dirt or whatever it was that he put together, right? So he made us a whole being. He made us matter and spirit both. And we continue to be uh, integrated human beings, although we understand there is a distinction in us between those two realities. But we constantly realize that those are integrated. And even when we die, we understand death is really unnatural, in part because that which was meant forever to be put to, together is now what? Separate. Separated. And, the, and the, we look forward to the day when those two are put back together in the new spiritual body, which is still a body of no spiritual. Right? Is this starting to click a little bit, maybe? All right. So Darwin is uh, Marx and Engels. Engels was the money man for Marx. Um, gave him uh, a lot of money to to help him keep on. So they were excited when Darwin's book came out because it fit perfectly with their materialistic worldview. Materialistic worldview, again, which is much of, mo much of what is embraced in our culture today, even if they aren't epistemologically self-conscious. Mechanism was rejected by Marx. 
His is a dialectical materialism. He's still in the tradition of the Greek dialectics. The idea now was transformed into opposing forces in history. Formidable, but predetermined for destruction because the material must triumph. Both practice without theory and theory without practice were rejected. Ideas were not abandoned for mechanism. They were retained, but the ideas were grounded in matter. But to be honest, he is at that point contradicting himself even when he appeals to the ideas at all. Even if they're grounded <laughs> in matter. Because ideas can't exist because ideas aren't what? Material. Aren't material. They aren't real. They don't have any substance. You, if you kick an idea, uh, idea, it won't hurt your foot if you kick it hard enough. Mm -hmm. right? If you lick an idea, you won't get any taste out of it. Biblical faith, on the other hand, denies the ultimacy of both mind and matter. There's an, an answer to Amy's question. And declares both to be aspect of God's creation. There is thus no determination by either mind or matter. The omnipotence of criticism is denied as is the determination of all things by material forces. God being sovereign, omnipotent, ultimate, all things are determined by him from all eternity. So all things are not determined by matter. All things are not determined by ideas. All things are determined by God. The Christian's approach to the world is not in terms of criticism nor revolution, but in terms of God's regenerating power. Like the idealist, the Christian is interested in interpretation, but not the interpretation of critical analysis. Again, remembering critical analysis is the idea that man starts from his sovereign self and by his own autonomy interprets everything in terms of himself. The Christian is interested in that. The Christian is in, interested in God's interpretations of all things and how that's set forth in principle by his inscripturated word. It becomes the duty of the covenant man to see all things in terms of that word. But like the Marxists, he cannot regard interpretation as a goal in itself. His purpose must be to change all things through Christ. Right? So we do have some common ground with the Marxists. We want to see the world changed. It's not just a matter of interpretation. It is a matter of change. But unlike the Marxists, the change isn't happening according to our autonomous mind or according to materialism. The change is happening because we're walking in terms and moving in terms of God's word. Make sense? Which is why then, again, we are people of the book. Thus, Christian faith, if it rests in sterile and isolated intellectualism, is false to its premises. The same is true of ecclesiastical activism in the social realm. In both cases, there is a denial of the fact that the biblical faith gives us a world and life view. Basic to scripture is the fact that it is the word of the sovereign and creator of all things, so that neither idealism nor materialism can do, any, can do other than deny him. So again, that's, why, that's where we say a pox upon both your houses. The expression of Christianity is neither in ideas solely nor, nor in action, in either criticism or revolution, but in faith and obedience. Nehemiah is a good summation of the biblical faith. Remember the book of Nehemiah? What, what's Nehemiah famous for? Building the wall. Rebuilding the wall, right? When his enemies saw his efforts, they at first derided him as a joke, and later they treated him as a threat. Nehemiah had two choices. He could have entered into dialogue with his enemies to persuade them of the innocence of his efforts, and try to gain their goodwill. He could have dropped all efforts at reconstruction in favor of a rigorous policy of defense and offense, of dealing with the enemy directly and immediately. He did neither. Nehemiah and his men labored with their weapons girded on their side. They rejected both criticism and dialogue on the one hand, and revolutionary action on the other, in favor of godly reconstruction, and God blessed them. They had both the trowel and the sword. Systematic theology cannot be simply an exercise in thinking. And it cannot be simply a systematization of biblical thought. It must be thinking for action in terms of knowing, obeying, and honoring God by fulfilling his mandate to us. It cannot be an abstraction from battle. It is related to what happens to church, state, school, family, arts and sciences, the vocation, and all things else. So, in, in biblical theology, biblical Christianity, there is the intellectual aspect, but it's not the intellectual aspect divorced from putting it into what? Practice into action. That's right. And so that's what you often find in the church. This is what we were trying to read about last week. In some places you'll find just the intellectuals, and they're not even they're not trying to change the world as they walk in light of the scripture. On the other hand, you find the people who are trying to change the world, but their minds are not hooked and anchored in scripture. Systematic theology is thus far more than a course in the seminary curriculum. The purpose of which is to organize the student's ideas about theology. Systematics presupposes an ordered knowledge because God is the absolute order 
And God requires that man, created in his image, bring all things within his province, including man himself, into line with God's order and purpose. The Bible is a manual for dominion under God. It declares God's word and requirements and it summons man to obey. The Bible gives us God's marching orders for creation. Systematic theology cannot content itself with organizing information. The incarnation is at the heart of our faith. The incarnation of God the Son is a unique event, but its implications are universal. What God requires of man and the earth must be embodied in all of our lives and activities and all that we are and do, or else we deny the word and the God who gave the word. We began by stating that systematic says that God is God. To say that God is the Lord means that we are to be totally under the absolute government of his word because we are totally his creation and our redemption is totally his work and a manifestation of his sovereign grace. No theology, no preaching can faithfully set forth the God of Scripture without making clear, fully clear, his absolute ownership of us so that we, our lives, callings, families, substance and times must be totally commanded by him. This is, of course, the task of all theology and of all preaching. What systematics does is to set forth in particular clarity the unity, the particularity, and order in the Word of God in order to better arm the man of God. Systematics then works to strengthen epistemological self-consciousness. This kind of systematic helps us to think straight. And it helps us then to also at the same time see where what our belief system requires of us in terms of application. So it works to strengthen epistemological self-consciousness by striking out against the inconsistencies of smorgasbord religion. Remember what I said earlier? Thinking systematically drives you insane? This is what he's getting at right here. Listen to the sentence again. It works to strengthen epistemological self-consciousness by striking out against the inconsistency of smorgasbord religion. So you become increasingly epistemologically self-conscious because of your systematics. You increasingly see what around you? Smorgasbord religion. Smorgasbord religion being filled with contradictions and inconsistencies. And one by one, you pull your hairs out until you don't have to <laughs> go to the barber anymore. All right? Systematic theology works to uproot alien presuppositions and to clarify the biblical mandate. So again, systematic theology causes us to think differently, especially when we're living in a post-Christian post culture. Systematics, however, stresses not man, but... God, so that man's sin, his calling, and his future are seen not in terms of man's hopes and needs, but in terms of God's purpose and order. So systematic theology is what I was teaching Becca this morning. It's radically God-centered, right? It's vertical before it's horizontal. Because man is a sinner, he is man-centered. He seeks to make the universe revolve around who? Himself. Himself. Man-made religions reflect this orientation. Their goal is the fulfillment of man. And God is a resource in that purpose. And so, in man-centered religion, God might be in man-centered religion, but he's only there because by being there, then man can get what he wants. You see, God exists for man. So, what does that tell us? That tells us you can have lots of religion that's not, that's not honorable to God because really it's pursued not for God's purposes or for God's end, but for man's. Man-made religion reflects this orientation. Their goal is the fulfillment of man, and God is a resource in that purpose. Systematic theology, however, must work to restore perspective to religion, to give it its necessary God-centered focus and brief to let God be God. Because theology has often become abstract or materialistic, it overlooks the plain words of Scripture from Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment which with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This is an unpretentious goal, but it is a scriptural one. St. Paul makes clear the same, setting aside, the same setting aside of the world's ways and wisdom is declaring from 1 Corinthians, for the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing, that is the materialist and the idealist, it's foolishness, but unto us which are being saved it's the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring it to nothing, I'll bring nothing to understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise.
God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So the goal of systematics clearly is to glorify God and to work and move in terms of God's revealed law work. We are not idealists, neither are we materialists. We are people who walk in terms of God's law word and who look for the regeneration of all things. Very good chapter. Any questions? Tell me that some of that made sense. Okay? Because if it doesn't make sense, if it's going, then, you know, we might be better being more slow about, about reading it. Okay. Prayer requests, praise items this evening. Prayers for Linda and Alex, Okay. Okay. Miss Linda is still recovering. Anybody else? Uh, I got one more thing. Okay. Um, this afternoon I got a Facebook message from uh, Sonny Richards. And it appears as though probably within the next few weeks they'll be moving here to Michigan. Yeah, I have, I've heard whisperings of that. Uh, some of you some of you know the Richards, some of you don't. Uh, they're a they're a family that when I first met them via the internet, I've talked to them on the phone several times. Uh, this is several years back now, they're living in Missouri. Uh, after they lived in Missouri, they moved to New York because that's where her family was at. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole story, but there are things that haven't worked out there. He was offered a better job in the Farmington Hills area, as I recall, and they're moving to Michigan, and their plan is to move somewhere like halfway between and be a part of this congregation. Well, I think I that's mean, the, no. It's, it's it's pretty close to being South Lansing as far as where they will be moving to. Uh, my understanding that was still open, but if you talk to today, you would know more than I would. I talked to them today, just before coming here. Okay. So that's the thing we can rejoice about, um, and that's something that, uh, like every new family that joins, there's, there's there's additions, and there's you know when you have a new baby, there and this is just an analogy there. Are, Challenges, but we can be thankful that that this is on the horizon. All right. On Thursday morning, I'm scheduled to have some more X-rays because the doctor told me that when everything is not well with your gallbladder. In fact, he says you have stones in the gallbladder. So I said, well, chickens. You get the x rays Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, it's coming Tuesday. They probably won't give you results right away. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Is that going to be in Lansing? Somewhere in Lansing, if I have the address. Okay, it's not in the hospital, but it's in a big doctor's where there's a number of doctors and x rays and stuff like that. All right, anybody else? Keep us posted on that. I understand uh, gallstones can be extremely painful. Did they start moving or something? I don't know. If they block the bile duct, yes. They came I thought I was having a heart attack when I had my gallbladder attack. You did? I just, was, I just couldn't breathe and I had such a pain in my back. I thought I was having a heart attack and Bill brought me to the doctor's office and by then, then the pain went away. Keep us posted, Gary, please. I will. Sure. Right. Anybody else? All right. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessing.
blessings that you provide for your people. And we want to be consistent in our thinking systematically. And thank you, Father, for making us a people that desire to think straight. We understand that that's your work. We understand it's your work um, that finds any desire within us to be vertical and God-centered in our, our, our orientation. We understand, Father, that it's not because, hey, we're smarter than everybody else and we figured this out. It's not because uh, somehow we have more insight. It's because you, by thy grace alone, given us the Holy Spirit to, to see your truth as it, as it works out through Scripture, that the, the goal and intent of everything is that your name would be glorified and honored. We pray that you would deliver us, Father, from thinking that somehow you're a God who's in it for us. As if you're the God who revolves around us and our needs and purposes. We know that you're for us, Father. We're not, we're not denying that, but we understand that in your being for us, it's primarily because you're for yourself. That you use us, Father. That you gloriously have condescended to use us to glorify thy name. And so, Father, we understand that even when you bless us, and we're thankful when you do, that even when you bless us, it's for the purpose that we might in turn have the capacity and ability to bless you. So make us Christocentric. Make us uh, centered upon the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and all that we think and all that we do. Forgive me, forgive us, when so often selfishness creeps in upon us and we so often see ourselves as the measure of all things and everything that's happening. Grant us grace to put off that old man and put on the new man, created in Christ Jesus, that is good with what John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Deliver us, Father, from our self-centeredness. Deliver me from my self-centeredness and help us to truly be what you count as a humble people. And yet, Father, we pray that in, our, in that humility, in that humbling, that our desire would be that your name would be spoken up, that your name would be pursued, that people would come to bow to the God who is, not the God of their own imagination. We pray, Father, that you would defeat the materialists in our age, which are everywhere, Pray, Father, that you would crush them by converting them and causing them to pursue Christ. We pray that you would defeat the idealists, those who think that the only reality is spiritual reality. We pray, Father, that you would crush and defeat them, and that you would crush and defeat those then who posit a dualism that cannot be reconciled. We pray instead, Father, that we would be a people who are integrated, understanding that you've created us body and spirit, that you've put together, and what you've put together no man should separate. And we pray that we would see throughout our lives this modified unicotomy that describes who we are as whole people. And so we pray you would give us the ability to move in your terms, not looking for revolution, not looking just to interpret the world, but looking to understand the world and then seeing it regenerated as we walk in terms of obedience to you. There are a lot of high ideas here, Father, that a lot of people would consider useless, but we pray that we would see the power of ideas and we pray that we would see how this is practical to our living. So grant us the grace to be able to know the times and to know what to do by understanding the ideas that shape the times. All of these ideas, Father, they drive, for example, materialism drives Marxism and, and idealism drives romanticism. And all of these ideas drive worldviews that are unhealthy and hurt people. And so we pray that we might understand these matters increasingly that we might glorify your name. We pray, therefore, that philosophy, philosophy might once again find itself submitting itself to the creator and redeemer of all reality, and that it might find its proper place again so that it's not trying to operate independently. We pray, likewise, for the other disciplines, sociology, which tries to be the materialistic answer to all questions. We pray that you would cause it to bow the knee to Christ. Grant us grace to, to think your thoughts after you, and even if it makes us oddballs, separate from what much of the other world on all different sides thinks, make us content with that, knowing that if having you, we need nothing else. Father, we pray that as we continue to be given the grace to think systematically and so become more epistemologically self-conscious, we pray also at the same time you give us the ability to be able to engage people. Yes, as we see these inconsistencies and contradictions, it causes us to be a bit exasperated, but we pray that we would be mindful of how patient you are, not only were, but currently are with us, so that we might be given the grace 
to be engaging and patient with, with others as well. And we pray, even as we pray that, we pray that we would not compromise. And so grant us, thy Holy Spirit, to know how to find a path to walk through all these landmines, so to speak, to, to how to embrace people, engage them at the same time, challenge them um, with the inconsistency of their smorgasbord religion. Help us, Father, to, in loving you, then know how to love other people. And if it takes us being wounded, Father, we're even willing to go that far if it means that people would accept and embrace the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We do pray, Father, for the concerns of your people. We think of Linda as we prayed this morning, so we pray again that you would give her health. We're thankful, Father, for the wife and mother she is. And we pray, Father, that you would raise her up so that she continue to do well as she already does well. Encourage her, Father. We pray likewise um, for Gary as he has these health issues that he's been told of. We pray that you give the doctors wisdom in terms of uh, a diagnosis, in terms of what should be done. If it has to be this... Um, small surgery they do these days or whether it's okay to wait a while, whatever, we pray that you give the doctors wisdom to help Gary to continue to look for you. Thank you, Father, for his good humor. We pray also, Father, um, for the Richards family as they're, it looks like they're moving to Michigan. Um, we pray that you keep them safe and all the, all the things that need to line up in terms of falling into place that need to happen. We pray that those things would come to pass. This job that's been offered or tendered, we pray that that would, would definitely come through and there'd be no issues um, when it comes to that job. We're thankful, Father, for what we've been told, that it promises an, an increase in pay uh, from what he was receiving in New York for the same kind of work. And we pray, Father, that as they look to be a part of this faith community, that that will receive them well and they will be received well. Already we pray, Father, that you give us wisdom in how to minister to them and how to encourage them. And Father, we have prayed often for you to add to our numbers, so if this comes to pass, we're thankful, Father, uh, for this answered prayer. We pray, Father, for your people here tonight um, as you continue to mold them and shape them to swim against the current of the times, that you give them strength, ability. We pray, Father, that the same thing that we just prayed, that you give them the opportunity to, to be little evangelists, little apologists for Christ. And we pray, Father, that the love that we have for the brother would also be a tool in our arsenal to set forth your glory. Not only are we defending the faith, not only are we setting forth the truth of Scripture, not only are we correcting, admonishing, encouraging, but also then we're showing in our own confines, how behold how they love one another. So grant us this, Father. Grant us this that we might honor you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Right, we have seven minutes left. We'll be enough time to get through John. The passage that we looked at this morning. Some of these matters that we're going to speak of tonight I've spoken on before. There won't be a great deal of difference newness and what you hear in some of these things. We are to a Thomas now. Jesus, is go, of course, is talking about when I go to prepare a place. I encourage you this week, it's not very, it's, this is Holy Week, so spend this week reading some 13 through 17 and keep an eye opening, open for the, the coming and going, sending, that kind of language. It's all over the chapters 13 through 17 becomes quite important. At the sending, of course, eventually he'll get to the point that he's going to send forth. If I go away, then I will send another. I will not leave you as orphans. Right? So we said that this whole section of chapter 14 is about Jesus trying to comfort his disciples. It starts out with, let not your hearts be troubled. He says the same thing again in verse 27 that unites this section of scripture into the theme of Jesus trying to comfort his disciples. We noted how in many respects that is really incredible considering the fact that Jesus himself is only a few hours away from the cross and he knows what's in front of him. 
And yet, despite his own trials, his own sufferings that he knows he's on the cusp of, his concern is for his disciples, his people. How much more so, even yet today, now that he's resurrected at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, how much even more so now he continues to comfort and encourage his people. He says to Thomas, Thomas asks, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. There was those I am statements that I mentioned this morning. We want to look at some of the similar language that we find about Christ being the way. If you look to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, we find hints of that kind of language there. And keep your Bibles open to Hebrews 9, 9, 8, 10, and 19, and 20. 9, 8 first says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way, the way, verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest when the first tabernacle was still standing. All right, the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the tabernacle was still standing. The tabernacle is no longer standing. The tabernacle is now who? Jesus. Christ. He is the tabernacle. He is the temple. And now he can, it can be said of him that he is the way. The way is now set forth. Chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having blown us to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living what? Way. All right? By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. All right? So Jesus, when Thomas asks, we don't know the way, he points to who as the way? Himself. All right? So if we look to Christ, if we understand that Christ is the one who opens up heaven's portals for us, who's, who's prepared the place for us as we looked at this morning, we understand that he is the one who's provided a way into the presence of God, right? He's provided a way so that God now has favor upon us. He's provided a way so that we now have peace with God. And so well it should be that Jesus points to who? Himself as the one who is the way. And that's what the emphasis should fall on in this particular passage because that's where Thomas's question was. Lord, we don't know the way. Jesus points to himself as the way. So Jesus begins to define himself. And this is important when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's important to understand that Jesus is defining himself here. And that keeps us from then taking the name of Jesus and defining it ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we're going to serve Jesus, it's got to be the Jesus of Scripture. And one, way that, one thing that we know about the Jesus of Scripture is he says he is the way, exclusively the way. There, indeed, when it comes to the issue of how do I get to heaven, there is no answer that doesn't include Jesus Christ entering to the Holy of Holies as our tabernacle and, and being that means by which we come into God. Right? So this gets rid of all other religions that say that they promise heaven. Because if they don't include the Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible who makes a sacrifice for his people, who says, I am exclusively the way, then those religions must be counted as wrong, as an error, and we must plead with these people that they would turn, we must command them to repent in keeping with scriptures. Jesus says, I am the way. He points to himself. And that's why then we are people who are Christocentric, we're Christ-centered in our thinking. We're always talking about Christ and his exclusivity, his claims to exclusivity. But he not only says he's the way, he also says he is the truth. Here we might look at passages like uh, John 1.14. This issue of truth comes up repeatedly in the Gospels, we'll start with John 1, 14 and 17. Uh, we'll stay in John. The idea of the word truth becomes a, um, one of those words that's used repeatedly through John. When I was in college, we, I did a um, seminary, or not seminary, but a, a semester, that was the word I was looking for, on the book of John. And one thing that we had to do is we had to take a loose leaf Bible, and, and you took out the Gospel of John, you put it in your own folder, and then you would take colored pencils and you would do different things with colored pencils. And one thing you'd do is you'd find, for example, every time you find the word light, you'd put it in one color. Every time you find the word truth, you find another color. And the whole idea there was that you would see the themes and some of the words that John would keep repeating to. Some, so therefore you'd learn the emphasis of the book of John. John 1.14, when it talks about, Jesus says there in chapter 14, he's the truth. And in 1.14 he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Right? If you look at verse 17, just a few verses down. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth 
through Jesus Christ. We continue on, and we see in verse chapter 8, verse 32, this becomes an issue again. In chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, And you shall know what? The truth, and the truth shall set you free. All right, we come again then to just a few verses later in verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word or my truth has no place in you. So this idea of Jesus being the truth is something that John repeats. It's also a theme in, the, in his first epistle, this word true or truth. And Jesus says, I am the truth. Right? So therefore, if Christ says, I am the truth, therefore we know that truth, first of all, exists. Mm -hmm. um, I only pause to mention that because increasingly you live in a world, even if people aren't epistemologically self-conscious about it, increasingly you live in a world that says there is no such thing as truth, which at that point they've given you their, their version of truth, right? But Jesus points, himself at, points to himself as being the truth. So we know that there, are, there is absolute truth, and this brings in a whole wave of categories. There is right and wrong. There is good and bad. There is good and evil. It's not just a matter of, of relativism, as if there's no truth or truth is culturally situated or truth is culturally oriented. No. Truth has roots. There is absolute. And again, where does Christ point for that? In himself. So if we are a people who are anchored in Christ, we by definition ourselves are going to be a people of what? Truth. truth. And in a relativistic age, that's going to do what? It's going to drive people bonkers. Who do you think you are? How do you, how can you, you're so arrogant. How can you even begin to say, how can you be so certain about that? You're mean. I don't like your tone. Just because, just because we are people who are confident of what? Truth. There's no reason for us to be, to be apologizing over the fact that by God's grace we've learned truth. Now we need to be humble about it. You know, we need not to try to slap people across the face with it not considering their, their person, but we don't need to apologize because we know the truth. Jesus says of himself, I am the truth. Right? So that gets rid of all other categories for knowing truth that are not somehow related to Christ. Now again, when I talk about truth in a host of different areas, I don't necessarily always trace it to its root. But ultimately, if Christ is the truth, ultimately all truth goes back to Christ. So this gives us two areas to be passionate about. Gives us an area about to be passionate about about the way. Christ alone is the way. <clears throat> Jesus said that. Jesus has claimed to be God here as we look at this morning. He says he's the way. All people who deny Jesus then need to be rebuked. I don't you know, it may be gently done, it may be done between the eyes, but if they deny that Jesus is the way, they need to be told they're wrong. And if they invoke a Jesus that isn't consistent with Scripture as the way, they need to be told they're wrong. Same thing with the issue of truth. If they somehow are advocating for cultural relativism, if they're advocating that truth is historically situated, that there is no idea of truth, they need to be told they're wrong. Why? Because God's glory is at stake. And then they finally say, and here I'm wrapping up, Jesus finally says here, not only I am the way and the truth, he also says, I am the life. Here we find this idea in John eleven twenty five, 25. We want to look at John's theme of it. Eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the what? Life. And the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. It's not the only time that we find this. If you remember in John 4, the woman at the well. Sir, bring me this water that I will not have to return here again. Water is associated with what? Life. life right? Not only in John 4, where Christ is emphasizing himself as the uh, water of life, but also elsewhere in John, or in the Gospels rather, where Jesus talks about out of him will flow rivers of living water. Water being associated with what? Life. Now what's interesting here, and I'll close with this fun thing I just learned this past week, is that, that water was often connected to the idea of, of the temple. So if you remember in the book of Ezekiel, there's that strange chapter where in the book of Ezekiel, what's seen as being, as being flowing from the temple is waters that are covering everything and bringing back life to everything. Right? When we get to the, when we go back behind that to the Garden of Eden, 
There are the four water, the four rivers that, that are joining in the Garden of Eden. And I haven't got time to develop it now, but and I hope to maybe perhaps even next week. I'm not sure how I'm going to work this yet. But the Garden of Eden is seen as a temple sanctuary. And then that temple sanctuary in the Garden of Eden, there we find water, therefore we find life. Even there, of course, we find the tree of what? Life. The tree of life, right? And so when Christ appeals to himself as being life, there is that whole idea of, of conjuring up the idea of water and restoration of health. And, and of course, this was very meaningful in, a, in an arid uh, geographical area. And he says, I am the life. Elsewhere he says, I've come to give life and give a how? Abundantly, right? This is why I repeatedly say to us as Christians, people ought to look at us in envy because our life is bubbling and, and, and perking up. They don't have life. Without Christ, there is no life. All they have is the deadness and the raw ends of misery that they're chewing on. We alone have life and have it abundantly. The Christian life isn't a race to see who's the most miserable. The Christian life is full of life and abundance and happiness and joy. And that ought to be one thing that attracts people. And so Christ says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Incredible claims. Is that a good argument for pouring in baptism? Is that a good argument for pouring in baptism? That's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to give that some, some thought. All right. Anna and then Gary? Um, well, I would say that, remember, what, what salvation and judgment always come what? Together. Together. Okay? Yeah, we would say it brought salvation to his people. Right. And we have to remember that you have to look at whatever you see water, sometimes it's often used as a symbol of chaos in the scripture. So you have to see where it's situated and what theme it's, it's promoting. All right. Gary? Just an observation. Isn't it true that there were thousands of people that walked the face of the earth Christ came to earth, correct? Uh, presumably, yeah. Boy, they didn't have near as much of the Bible that we have today, and God's whole plan of salvation, uh, I would say, isn't really laid out very well in, in the Old Testament times. So I guess my question would be, will all those people be judged on the same standards as what we are? Uh, yeah, absolutely. God... God gave testimony of himself. Scripture says in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. So it's not as if God has left man without witness. No man will be able to stand before God and say, it's your fault you didn't give me enough information. Right? But it is true, we are blessed because we have a fuller revelation. They only had uh, the shadows, they only had the things that pointed, we have the reality. But uh, God doesn't owe, the thing we have to keep in mind is that God doesn't owe anybody Salvation. He doesn't owe anybody salvation. Remember? Um, what we all deserve is what? Church. Death. Death. Right? So God, if God gives to people what they deserve, nobody can charge God with being unfair. Okay. All right. Well, I took eight minutes from you tonight. Let's stand for the benediction and the doxology. If you want to read more about this, I think you can Google on Iron Inc. I think I've written at least about Christ's exclusive claims when he says, I am the truth. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures